Hello, welcome to the latest episode of Jordan Sorcery's GW Books Club. Today, we're going to be talking about 1989's Drakenfels by Kim Newman, writing under the pen name Jack Yeovil. This was the first full Warhammer fiction novel released by GW Books. My friend Stu and I are going to delve into our thoughts, feelings, and theories all about this awesome book. But before we get into it, I'm just going to provide you with a little overview of the story. The book starts with the end of a great adventure. Oswald von Konigswald, a young crown prince, and his ragtag party of heroes assembled over an arduous journey, a bounty hunter, his tutor and guardian, a squire, a soldier, a vampire, a dancing assassin, two dwarf warriors, and a wizard. These heroes are in search of the Great Enchanter, an evil, chaotic, necromantic, monstrous vampire, the legendary Drakenfels. On the path to Castle Drakenfels, most members of this party are cut down, many before we even meet them, and through the traps and encounters of a role-playing-esque dungeon, we find only Menesh the Dwarf, Genevieve the Vampire, and Oswald the Prince still standing for the final encounter with Drakenfels. Menesh and Genevieve are knocked unconscious, but Oswald overcomes the monster and a legend is written. 25 years later, we meet Detlef Serk, a prodigiously talented, though perhaps pompous and self-aggrandizing, youngish playwright, director, and actor. At present, he's in prison for an enormous amount of debt, the result of a catastrophic theatrical failure. But lucky for him, to celebrate the anniversary of Drakenfell's defeat, Serk is freed from prison by the now older, wiser, and somehow even more handsome Crown Prince Oswald. The main thrust of the story is Serk's composition of this celebratory play, reassembling the surviving adventurers from Oswald's original party, and staging a performance for the Emperor in the ruins of Castle Drakenfels itself. There are omens, ghostly monks in the windows, phantom carriages in the caravan, but yet the play still progresses, and one by one, the adventurers of 25 years hence are killed as part of some chaotic ritual to resurrect Drakenfels. During the first performance of the play Drakenfels, the real Drakenfels himself re-emerges, and the real Oswald is revealed as well. The Crown Prince, now the Elector Count, has been in league with Drakenfels since his comically pathetic attempt to kill the vampire two decades earlier. Genevieve and Detlef face down Drakenfels, and through some literal deus ex machina, they defeat him. Meanwhile, Oswald attempts to assassinate the Emperor Karl Franz, and is then similarly defeated by Detlef who, fortunately, had studied the same fencing forms from Oswald's former tutor. And then, all is well. We are treated to a denouement telling us the outcomes for pretty much every single character who was named in the book. So, Stu, before we start discussing the ins and outs, the multiple levels of the drama that is Drakenfels, how did you find it? Did you enjoy it? Yes, lots. A lot more than I, than I thought I would. And not because I thought it was going to be bad. Um, I just thought it might be of its time a little bit. But there was some really, and it, and it is in a sense, but there's some really, really fun parts in there. Bits that I found a surprise. And I don't always get surprised by books. I quite often see kind of things come in the annoying person that watches a film with my wife and, and will say yeah he did it or she did it or this is gonna happen <laughs> and there were little twists and things and I, I didn't the things I didn't expect mm. so from the start of the book that's almost like a prologue but I didn't realize it was a prologue to start with I think it just starts as chapter one doesn't it and it's I think it I think it does but it's that initial sort of start to the book and then it completely changes the scene and you think, oh, where, where's all those characters gone and i love it i love really that point made me smart i thought oh this is good that was an interesting way of doing this this book interests me now yeah um whereas the beginning of the book where it's very much that kind of the heroes reaching the end of their quest they're all dying nearly all of them dying and it's like the end of the story and i thought okay so the rest of the story is just going to tell us how they got there and then at the end, they might tell us what really happened. That was my my kind of in head guess of what it was yeah. going to be. And then it cuts to Detlef Serk and a 
just almost Victorian style Dickens as <laughs> debtors prison. And I was like, whoa, where's this gone? <laughs> Act one, what's this? And it took me a few moments to realize, ah, okay, this is how the story is going to go. And I thought, this is good. It really, really surprised me. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big left turn out of the prologue and what what you see there. Because I mean, mm. I I also absolutely loved it. I think it's a fantastic book. It's, I know what you mean about there's certain elements that are of its time, but I think it's aged really, really well. The drama is great. The comedy is great. The horror is great. And then yes. plot wise, it's just really well put together, I think. And yeah, <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. That prologue, that intro, which is so, it is a classic story of, yep. well, it's basically a, an advanced hero quest or a Warhammer quest very, adventure very right? fantasy isn't it very yeah. off the shelf fantasy written well it's not badly but almost i felt a bit like it was a start of a movie mm. kind of the, the movies start with the action prologues rather than the building up to it the ones that start with a major event yeah a big um, action scene for... big start it felt yeah. like that i think my initial notes for it, i scribbled down movie-esque start this is really really good and it was violent fight scene yeah. to start the book right in the grips of the fight scene mm. um and then it kind of got more bloody <laughs> and, it was and brutal it's... that the opening and the, the deaths of many of those heroes but I, yeah. one of the things that i do think because i agree it was really cinematic but i also think that he does so it, kim newman writing as jack yeovil who is a film critic as well as an author spent a lot of time immersed in cinema and, and sort of brings a lot of that to it but I think what he does that's incredibly effective is that you're actually getting real sort of character moments and little beats and explorations of who these heroes are, even yes. as they're being offed and destroyed and exploding across <laughs> across the room. You're, you're also finding out a little bit about them. You get a little bit of background. They're not yes. quite two uh, like one dimensional. There's a, there's a little bit of extra dimensions to each of them just before they a snuffed out <laughs> yeah so welcome to this character they've done this and by the way i'm just going to kill them off and in a really yeah. nasty way but they it's entertaining they're entertaining deaths aren't they deaths that make you think oof and yeah as a as a at the demographic at the time i can imagine a lot of young boys think this is, this is brilliant um and so th th there's a lot of dark humor to those that things you may have seen in, in 80s kind of horror films um but there was stuff that was a bit more dark as well i mean when when they enter the, the the chamber at the end, and he opens the the portal or the window to the other realm, and that's almost I don't know it made me think of and I wouldn't have been out at the time, but almost that the demon realms in Constantine or mm. um, and then some of the the, the monsters and things is almost Hellraiser esque, isn't it? It's that real yeah, kind yeah. of grossed out but weird gross horror, not just kind of slasher. It's yeah. kind of that kind of real cringy, change through skin kind of weird stuff that you see in Warhammer through yeah. your realm of chaos and, and things like that. But oh, yeah, it was just, it was, there was just pretty dark and depressing. And you know, who am I looking at through this window? Oh, the tortured soul of my father. It's, I mean, this is, this is dark, dark stuff, isn't it? Yeah. And um, the traps as well were quite effective. Quite yeah. good D and D traps. I mean, there was the one that, that has caused Rudy uh, Wegener to just collapse, crumpled into uh, contorted, kind of, yeah, and, and he definitely seems like right. That's the end of that character. And then there's the gargoyles that come out of the ceiling, which I love that scene. I'm a big fan of gargoyles, so getting to see some of them uh, in in the Warhammer world doing some cool stuff was great. But yeah, there's a real. It's the party arriving at the climax. They face down Drakenfels in all of his fearful, magnificent glory, and yes. we don't even get to see it because it it fades to black essentially right yes. and we we don't see Absolutely. the heroic moment of oswald taking him out but then we move beyond it and we we know it has happened right we're told okay constant drakenfels was defeated now let's move on to as you say this very different story 25 mm -hmm. years later detlef sir a playwright who is now yeah, has run up an enormous debt because of a, a hugely ambitious but failed performance of, or didn't even get to the performance of this other play. And we're just joining him in a prison. Yes. Yeah. And it's kind of, I suppose there's something, but I, I forgot this. I keep forgetting this because it's almost something you don't need, but there's, 
a bit more background before that, isn't there? We've skipped a bit because in that second, before we get to Act One, there's like a there's a chapter around um, Genevieve's background, isn't there? And I kind of I feel like we've we maybe skipped ahead. We um, see Genevieve's it's, it's, background. We get some of her. Some of that to before we at the end of the the, the kind of the main fight scene. We get a little sure. bit of that. We get her background before we go to Detlef, don't we? Unless I'm misremembering the order. I think we get. Uh, so I think we get hints. I mean, I can't remember the specifics now that you mention it. Whether or not we see some of that once we know she's in the convent and she's sort notes. of retired from heroic yeah, life I think it's, and public I think life. It's chapter two ish, isn't it? I think that's before right. we get there. I think there's a bit of background about Drakenfels's history and his and how he killed her father. Sure. Talks about um when she was um bitten herself and and, and there's all that. There's a little bit about Paravon and 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 Bretonia when she was growing up. So there's definitely a bit of background scene setting for her. And then mm. then we leave that I think. So these kind of we well, whichever order that well. is, we do jump into. So we get debt left, and we get yes. But point. then after that, it's definitely definitely debt left. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we get debt left um, there, and it's quite humorous as well. I think there's as much as it paints a picture of a very bleak circumstance that he's found himself in. You also mm -hmm. really, or at least I found that I really enjoyed spending time with him because he is yes. quite witty and dry, and he's he's sort of taking all of this terrible fate in quite good humor. But his good humor sort of manifests as taking the Mickey of it out of it and sort of being yes. very sarcastic about everything. I think it's almost hopelessness, isn't it? But he's, yeah, he, he's, I can't remember. The, I should remember it because he's repeated a hundred times in one paragraph. But the amount of money that he, he sure. owes a hundred and nineteen thousand two hundred and fifty-five gold pieces. Now I've got that written down, so I, I, I didn't remember it off the top of my head. It's repeated quite a few times in a row. But there's a whole little <laughs> almost skit about it, isn't it? About yeah. the but it's 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 such a what a huge amount of money that um he's never going to be able to pay it off and yeah. that's it he will the best he can hope for is to become um a sort of a senior prisoner really and and yeah. uh, and maybe get the get some favor that way and that's, that's all he, so he's almost kind of like well this is my lot now um every day he wakes up he's lost some more clothes someone's robbed him <laughs> he's good clothes to sell it or he's lost his hair because someone else is selling it to uh to, to a wig maker and i think he, he he thinks that he remembers that hopefully they don't realize that there's physicians out there who buy body parts <laughs> you know, it's, it's little lots of little gags like that very yeah. dry and self-deprecating kind of humor and uh but yeah it does seem a little bit where's this story going but i was interested to to know because it was it was a very weird story, a busy start then there's almost the sereneness of this is genevieve and this is her background and then it's kind of real change and it sticks with detlef mostly on uh, it does divert off to the other characters but it goes back to him it feels like for the most of the rest of the, the, yeah. the book and it's driven by him even though he's not really there for the first x amount of of, of pages of the story yeah he definitely feels like the protagonist to me as much mm. as it's you know, we're introduced at the start through Genevieve's perspective, mm -hmm. and she's incredibly important. She's, you know, almost a, a co-protagonist or a supporting protagonist, if you yes. like. Yeah, yeah. And and that will be an important relationship and dynamic through the whole story. And then there's also Oswald von Konigswald, who is the hero who defeats Drakenfels, who commissions Detlef to write a play, who's present throughout the whole story because he is this kind of noble hero, an elect count or almost an elect count of the empire the ideal kind of protagonist, if you like, for a yes. Warhammer novel, you would think. He's there throughout, but he's definitely in the... He, he sort of stepped back a little bit. We we see some stuff from his... We follow him in certain chapters and, yes. and sort of see what he's up to, but it's way more Detlef's story. Absolutely. If it was a film, he would be a supporting actor, and so would Drakenfels probably be. Oh, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a story about mostly Detlef, with a sort of supporting lead would be Genevieve, but the, the other two are, are are your supporting actors in that big parts, but and important to the story. But it's definitely, sorry, my uh, watch is trying to join in on the conversation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but they, they, you know, they're they're not don't need to be present all the time in the story. It would yeah. be it would be very different if they were present. All the time in there. And the, the the kind of the tool of telling it through um, Detlef's experiences of the play is, is just such a unique 
way of doing it and not something I expected having started the book or even made my way through the first, you know, two chapters or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool hook almost. You know? It is right. Having the story like a war, the first Warhammer novel, and it's not about war. It's not about heroes in a unit or squads going off and doing missions. It is about a playwright <laughs> who is trying to capture sort of his version of the truth of a legendary event. So we've seen some yeah. of that legendary event, and obviously things start to happen around the play that then move us towards, okay, there's going to be some, there is going to be some horror and some action again. But it's very much, it spends a lot of time kind of going, I, actually, this is almost a comedy. Uh, it's Shakespeare in love set in the Warhammer world. It really is. And and it does a terrific job, I think, of, of through the comedy, through the enjoyment of Detlef as a character, through the interest. And there is obviously that mystery around Genevieve. She's quite an enigmatic character and quite an interesting character as well. Through them, it does hook you and you do sort of want to continue and find out is this play are they going to stage the play and is the the yes. climax of the the book going to be whether or not they get the play right uh, yes. but then obviously we sort of start to see drakenfels reemerge as a presence and there's these sort of haunting signs there's a a, a couple of ghost monks almost threaten detlef and kind of try yeah. and warn him off there is a bit when they're so they gather up all of the survivors from the original quest uh, including a couple of characters who seemed like they might have died during that quest, yes. but somehow survived. Uh, and then they are all brought together to inform the play and help write it, and then to go back to the abandoned Castle Drakenfels in what is a great idea, I think. Let's go and stage a play in our nemesis, <laughs> in his actual seat of power, uh, and we're going to bring the emperor and we're going to bring everybody in the, the court of the emperor to see it. Uh, yeah. And then on that journey, there's a, there's a really fun device, I think, where there's a, they have 26 carriages in their caravan, but yeah. they continually are finding that when they count them, there's actually 27, but then they can't work out yes. what the 27th caravan is. Uh, it, it's such a, a, a weird... It's good, spooky, horror. Yeah, again, really spooky. It? It just cuts in and out. If you, it, it, so it starts with... This kind of D and D meets Hellraiser. You get a little bit of the the first twenty minutes of Joan of Arc style um, setting with the Britannia background history kind of thing, and then it cuts to Shakespeare in Love, and then comes back to the kind of uh, let's go to the haunted house for <laughs> yeah. see what happens. It will be fine, honest. We're all along your novel. Something's going to happen, isn't it? It's um, that was one thing that didn't surprise me. There were there was lots of little surprises, definitely with the story structure and the way it worked, and a couple mm. of things that happened. But I don't think it's any surprise to any reader that well, yeah, he's clearly you know you know he's going to come back in one sense or another at, at, at the end because of he's just so set up for that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's bizarre. Um, if you put it out, if someone said, this is the, the way I'm going to lay the story out, you'd think, oh, that's a, that's a little strange, really. <laughs> you, you, but it worked so well. And I don't think it would have worked the other way around. I think you started with Detlef. And then the story of the original attack was kind of told as a, well, you know, tell me what happened so that I can write this play. I don't think it would have had the impact and worked. And I think maybe it have, people would have stopped reading early on because there wouldn't yeah. have been enough of a hook. But it changes the pace in such a sort of delightful little way that it sort of works really really well yeah yeah i totally agree i mean how did you find the presence of drakenfels like looming over the entire story i think yeah i think it worked quite i really liked the lowenstein character it was felt very kind of almost <laughs> the boris karloff looking kind of yeah. strange tall um slightly weird scary looking actor um very comical but that it worked it didn't it didn't seem too much it was just right for the, the style of story with the tongue in cheek a lot of the time um but yeah i think it was there i think it was it wasn't just him it was through through the castle and then the weird happenings and things all the way along so we talked about the monks mm. that felt like very kind of 1970s weird horror films where they didn't have any effects but it was just some shadowy figures on a on a misty hill in the uh, late at night or early morning it felt very kind of so i'm pointing at the the hill which is <laughs> at the hill there. Yeah. <laughs> the hill there is a hill over there but none of you can see it. but um it it so it, it 
did it well with that. I think the the, the spooky happenings, both at the where were they before they went to Drakenfels? They were at um, Oswald's. Um, yeah, they were at the palace or something. The, yeah, some kind the, the of palace of the uh, Elector Count of Oslo. Elector Count Oslo. Yeah, so there was things started to happen there hmm. as well um and, and it's it's very typical horror isn't it that they're kind of something happens to someone but everyone else is like well I'm probably all right i'm sure you're just making it up it's in your head kind of feel <laughs> so it's very very classic um horror film in that sense but the way it was done you you knew it was drakenfels and you felt that in sort of in, in, an impending sense of doom and it was you knew it was going to build to a crescendo at some point um yeah. and uh, and again I think because of the way the play was working and the way the play was just, I mean, it's not just a play, is it? This is some kind of almost living experience. It goes on for hours. There's breaks for <laughs> meals and then it goes back on for hours. And, and there's, there's talk about um, the, the emperor worrying about his, whether his son can make his way through it without getting too fidgety as a parent. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> so if, I, <laughs> if I take my kids to the cinema and it's more than 90 minutes, I'm, I'm getting worried about how many toilet trips we're going to need to do in the middle of it. I still don't know how they got the bridge across the bridge in the uh, Dungeon and Dragons movie. Cause I missed that <laughs> bit taking my son to the toilet, but, uh, but, but it's, it, I liked all those bits cause they were kind of real. And, it's a bizarre thing to say, but it's quite real and relatable to the real world. You wouldn't. Yeah. How often in a in a fantasy story or a horror have a character kind of thinking about my son might get bored watching this but well, that's, it's not yeah a, and that's what i mean about those little, writing yeah little, it's really great because you have all of these little character moments across all of the characters and it, it just deepens every single one of them i think that like when you're you get introduced to okay here's a, an actor and they have a particular foible or a that you know they are challenging they're difficult to work with or they're really good or so you have all of these different moments with most of the characters i think there's one or two characters that maybe a little just a, a tiny bit underwritten so there's like yes. a dwarf called menesh who was one of the heroes who uh, loses an arm during the original uh, conflict to the the encounter with dragonfalls he's in it but we don't really see very much of him. He's kind of there to pad out the numbers, and then he's also one of the sort of dramatic. Because he's quite important at the end, on. to a certain extent. He has an important yes. moment at the end. Indeed, yeah. He probably could have been in it a little bit more, just to remind. We don't really get a sense of his character. I think is is the thing. I know, yeah. and, and dwarves generally, and we'll talk a little bit more about how this relates to the Warhammer world as we may understand it. But um, I think, in terms of characters, for for the main players i mean your your detlef and genevieve oswald and drakenfels we get quite really well-rounded quite deep and rich stories for those characters but then all of the surrounding characters the supporting characters also get really nice interesting moments there's some really sweet moments i thought with so rudy who was yep. the sort of hero who had fallen into that trap he'd kind of been contorted and really injured he did survive and then recover but then yeah. he's lived the rest of his life just as a bit of a drunk trading on that success of being part of the defeat of Drakenfels. And we also then find out that one of the other heroes who was there, a dancing assassin called Esbert, yeah. she was actually his wife. And right, yes, she yes. lost her mind during this quest to to face Drakenfels. And she's been in an asylum the, the entire 25 years. And there's just some really powerful little moments with rudy and that sadness of what he lost and his relationship and and then he is actually killed as part of a ritual to bring drakenfels back but he's given he gets to host a party at the castle the night they arrive and detlef yeah. is sort of like oh you know we'll, we were going to have a party anyway but we'll let rudy feel like it's his party so he kind of gets one last hurrah as being the hero of the hour Everyone wants to hear his stories and he gets to get drunk in good company. And then he goes to his his very unfortunate fate. <laughs> but as a as a reader, I kind of felt like okay, he's got he actually got quite a sweet send-off before the, yes. the, you know, the horrific stuff. And those it moments was, were really good. There was there's almost an element of you could have had those characters returning heroes and they'd all be back for the fight, but instead it's it, it, the They've gone on a route of mental health issues, alcoholism, probably mental health issues linking to that as well. So it's kind of re real, probably a much more realistic um, 
yeah probably the people like PTSD would, would, sort of yeah. yeah exactly exactly so it's that's that it's quite real mm. um and yeah rudy had a nice kind of it was almost kind of have a nice send off and and mm. and put him to bed <laughs> not yeah. really but you know what i mean um <laughs> <Yeah>. and <laughs> as but didn't really have a nice end as no, such. She had a, that was a little bit more dark murdering people her... and then taking her own life was kind of yeah yeah. yeah, and I think that that kind of is more about her not at least having the the moment of clarity to know that she didn't want to go back to yes. Castle Drakenfels. Um, yes. as, as brutal and sad and tragic as that as her story is, it was very much a sort of self actualization. I think of yes, right, I'm it, actually yeah, not I read going. It, I read to, it that way. Yeah, yeah. So there's like interesting ideas like that scattered throughout, and moments like that throughout that are quite effective. I think both in terms of. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked a bit about the comedy and the horror, both very powerful throughout, but these dramatic moments as well that work quite effectively, I think. Mm -hmm, definitely. And it, they're, they're almost, they're, they're not entirely significant to the story. And it's not a particularly long story either. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of these small things in there that maybe you wouldn't expect to be in there for a story of, it, of its length. Um, it's quite, quite, it's not complex, but the number of elements make it a little bit complaints in some some senses there's a lot of characters yeah um that's maybe too many at some points because you kind of oh because you might be away from like, like we talked about um menesh and he's kind of disappears through most of the book it, remembering oh that's yeah he's that dwarf isn't he because you, yeah. you're away from him for so long and um there's almost because it's a, a group of players they're going to be like that but you've got those and then you you've got people playing that the heroes and then the people playing the heroes and it's kind of a which which one's playing what hero and because it's not visual um mm. it can be there's a lot there's a long list of um the <laughs> dramatic person you know there's a lot of people in that in that book in that sense that only appear shortly and i i think i there was a point where I was trying because because I knew we we're going to talk about it and I'm not just reading it the way I normally would and I would just let it flow. I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to make a note. What did that person do? And then I, there was a point halfway through. I thought I'm not going to do that because I don't think these characters are that important to the yeah. overall story arc. But before you get there, you're thinking, should I do? I need to remember this person's interaction here or that. So that is, the key ones become most important, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, I think. So Drakenfels, he's kind of painted as, so we, before reading it, because uh, I actually read it, this is the second time I read it, I read it earlier this year was the first time I read it. But and before that, I kind of was given the sense that it was a vampire story and that Drakenfels was Kim Newman creating his like fantasy Dracula for, for the purpose. Mm -hmm. I say that as if Dracula is not fantasy, <laughs> but the Warhammer fantasy Dracula. Uh, yes. And, and there's an element of that, but Drakenfels is so much more than just a vampire. He's also a, a worshipper of chaos, a great sorcerer. He's summoning demons. He's got all kinds of different abilities and powers. He leads an army of orcs and the undead and goblins and all sorts of stuff. It feels like a demigod history. rather than a very much than, so, yeah, than, than a than a vampire. He doesn't Usually actually doesn't powerful feel like villain. a vampire. No, not certainly not in any sort of version of a vampire that we a might sense, recognize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a Warhammer vampire. But then as well, so Dragonfells is not quite a traditional vampire from Warhammer. I think Genevieve, who is also a vampire and a but a good vampire, also represents a slightly different take on vampires from what we would see elsewhere in the Warhammer history, if you like. Yes, I quite I really liked it. I like the idea of the not necessarily all bad. Mm. Um, vampires. and I wasn't aware of this. So it was one of the earlier notes I scribbled. I was like, okay, well, she's accepted to a certain extent. People are, are wary to a point, but mm. probably more intrigued by her, um, attracted to her, um, than they are worried about whether there's any danger there, so to speak. There's definitely two kinds of vampire that probably lots more than two, but there's two clear types the, the kind of the, 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 the fully dead um which are uh generally real nasty pieces of work and the the part dead <laughs> it's lukewarm i don't know uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that she's uh, and she's still i think i think it's about feeling isn't it there's still an idea of, of feeling and understanding and 
while she's quite a strange character in the sense that she's been alive so long that um, they just talk about her not really holding grudges and things anymore for, 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 for being bitten, but and also for her father's death. She's got gone past. She doesn't hate Drakenfels for, for killing her father because it's just too long ago. But but she does have compassion for people and clearly cares about people as well and, and, and almost is concerned that she might feed too long on somebody and all those kind of very human Mm. elements and the human elements of her seem very very strong still feels like she's almost got she's a human with a condition that means that she she can't see herself in the mirror that she has to feed on another's blood and you know and she she doesn't like sunlight too much but other than that um she's still human at heart so to speak yeah i yeah i think that makes that makes perfect sense and the vampires thing I also really like this version of the empire that not only accepts halflings and dwarves and elves and and all sorts of others, vampires can live in the empire as well as long as you're a law abiding citizen. Basically, I like yeah. it. Bring them back. I, yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think really it's really good. good. An interesting idea that that opens the door to some other interesting stories, and uh, you know, as as this is one of those. There's no reason I don't think to to I mean I obviously there's lots of reasons and they they did do this, but separating out, okay, actually the undead have to be a very separate thing. And even within the undead, they later separate that out into tomb kings and vampires. You get these increasingly levels sort of distinction within all of these different types. In this version of the Warhammer world, it's a lot more sort of muddy and kind of like overlapping and yes. it's not as defined yet. So you can do stuff like, well, there's vampires wandering around. There's, there's talk of a convent for werewolves at one point. You know, and that, that kind of thing. It's great. It's fun. <laughs> I'm trying to think where, where you see that kind of stuff. I'm, it rings a bell. It seems familiar with me, with 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 vampires and werewolves being treated that way and they're not always bad i think it reminds me of i'm trying to remember the name of the series now jim butch is the author i'm sure the dresden files is it that's it exactly i haven't read them for years so there's there's elements of that in that universe Mm. that they're not all bad in fact some of them are are good um the werewolves are good in the dresden files or the one group of them is um and and vampires can be the same some manage to live a, a, a normal ish lower well, uh, at night but a life that on the on the good side of things and this feels a little bit like that kind of thing obviously this came out that came before dresden files but yeah um i like it though it's 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 got more of a it's almost like a 90s buffy feel to it doesn't yeah. it there's a friendly element to it and I, it's yeah. kind of it's kind of nice yeah, and Genevieve even says, like, well, much like humans, there are some vampires who are bad people, and there are some mm-hmm. vampires who are good people. And she obviously is one of the vampires who is good, and she joins the quest. And as you say, it's not out of revenge, even though that's what Oswald sort of tries to use as leverage to convince her to join. She actually joins the quest because she's impressed with mm-hmm. Oswald himself and this kind of crown prince who has this real presence. He seems like a proper noble who is a hero. And we're told throughout the course of that early prologue that actually his ability to keep that group together and to forge forward through these impossible odds is Mm -hmm. actually impressive. He's every bit the hero and the crown prince that he seems to be. And then obviously there's, you know, the, the, the veil falls over that when Genevieve falls unconscious during that encounter with Drakenfeld at the end of the prologue. Yes. And then we return to Oswald as now 25 years older, still just crown prince. His father is is ailing, but still alive. But Oswald has kind of taken on all of the responsibility of being an elector count. He is this uh, important political figure. He's cuts a, a fine stride. He's fashionable. They talk a lot about how fashionable his clothes are, not too ostentatious, just the right level of dressed to impress. Uh, so Oswald really comes across as a hero, I think. And I think yes. this, Kim Newman paints a great picture of, like, I, you know, almost I was like a little bit in love with this Oswald guy. He sounds awesome. He's, <laughs> he sounds really great. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. But then obviously as we get to the end of the novel, we discover that the true 
villain of the piece, as much as Drakenfels is returning and, and does want to enslave the Empire, he's only been able to do that because of a deal he's done with Oswald, our crown prince, our would-be hero. So how, how did you feel about that that twist, that reveal? It, it did surprise me. So I I thought, yeah, I have no doubt that Drakenfels would, would, would come back, but I didn't realise I, I, that the knife at the, the throat of mm. Carl Franz was a, oh, okay. Um, and then it kind of made sense, but I suppose it surprised me again when he didn't seem like he was being forced into it. And I always felt like he would get to the that point. Well, I'm sorry, he's made me do it. He's got control of me somehow. Um, but he's, you know, it feels all the, you know, if he didn't go along with the story, he couldn't have come back. Mm. <laughs> he, he made the bargain um, with, with Drakenfels, obviously, to, to that he would set this up. I mean, this is a long plan. This is a, a long game, isn't it? He's got a lot of <laughs> yeah. patience to do this. But I just wonder <laughs> at any moment he he would have Oswald could have thought, if I just don't arrange this play, <laughs> he doesn't come back because all the components he needs to come back, all these people's different elements, different people's body parts, essentially, <laughs> that he needs to, to he could have defeated him probably, you know, he, he could have made up whatever story he wanted about how he killed him rather yeah. than being handed a sword um but he, he you find out that he, he you know he maybe really did want that or at least over time he's gone to but his, his mind has changed mm. he was he was he was young and impressionable and realized at the last moment that he had no power to kill drakenfels the first time and and you know usually you'd call him a coward but you know you wouldn't do that in, in in that situation i think a lot of people would 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 make that choice the, the, the strange bit is how he kind of waits his time and does the plan as as set yeah. out. i don't know i don't know if there's any maybe there's something underlying there but it doesn't feel like there's anything forcing him to do it but so maybe i he quite like that yeah, no, I think that's a good a Maybe good those point. monks, whoever they were, we don't well, really know who they were, but maybe he would have been, <laughs> maybe something would have happened to him if he didn't do it. I, who knows? But, but I, I like the idea that no, it, it is because he he's bought into the deal. Hmm. So I think, so on the Old Hammer Fiction podcast, which has done a great reading of, of Drakenfels, in that Lewis talks about, he kind of sees Oswald as this sort of cocky, almost like a, a sixth form prefect or a head boy kind of vibe to young uh, Oswald. And I can <laughs> remember the Bullingdon Club. Believe it. <laughs> yeah, that kind of like very self-assured. He comes from this position of privilege. He comes from a position where he's supposed to be the crown prince. He's supposed to have the world at his feet. He's supposed to be the guy who can defeat Drakenfels. And then when he gets into that room, he's lost most of his heroes and he yeah. does. he has no plan. There's no special weapon. There's no magic artifact. There's nothing. He's just going to try and fight Drakenfels, who's this eight-foot-tall necromantic vampire chaos lord who, <laughs> who's been around for thousands of years just ruling <laughs> this corner of the old world, and he's just got his sword. And there's yeah. a real... <laughs> I can believe there would be a moment <laughs> of just, okay, actually, I the, the world isn't quite made for me, and yeah. I'm as much as in this moment I'm going to do the deal because it's the only way I survive, yes. following that deal, and this was something that we talked about on my uh, Patreon live stream where we, we did our book discussion, there were some really good thoughts in there just around the idea that actually following that deal, maybe he's rationalized to himself that the world's not right because he he should have been able to defeat Drakenfels. He should have been able to be the hero because that's what he was supposed to be. So now he's angry at the world as a result of it. He's angry at Karl Franz because he gets to be this heroic emperor whilst the cowardly failure mm -hmm. of Oswald, which should never have been because he's supposed to be for, here for greatness, he sort of rationalizes, well, I'm going to take it all then and I'm going to do the deal with, with yeah. Drakenfels because the world isn't what it should be sort of thing. Yeah, it works it's um that kind of personality trait is something we see in in, in real life i suppose so it yeah, just unbelievable definitely arrogance has yes, corrupted yeah. him completely and that inability to kind of accept your your lot or your place in something and yeah and to respond to jealousy by well if you if i can't have it then we'll uh we'll destroy it yeah uh, but he's a really interesting character but yeah i, I expected him any to repent at, at some point and he just 
he didn't. He was, I, he was expecting a breakdown. I, yeah, he may force me to do it. I'm sorry. Um, and even after Drakenfels was was killed, he didn't. No, he's that fully point. just all in, all in on this. But and I quite liked what you, exactly what you were saying before about it is surprising the reveal that okay, actually the the true villain of this piece, the character who we've spent so much time with, who's betrayed his friends, his emperor, and us. This guy. It's a surprise that he's done this turn, but also it's kind of inevitable. There's enough clues throughout. I mean, we've seen Laszlo, who is the the, the actor who's playing Drakenfels, who ultimately transforms into Drakenfels follow, following the ritual. He's been meeting with an agent of Drakenfels who might have been Drakenfels. We don't know, but he's had some sort of sponsor for much of his dark crimes that he's done over his life. A person who's appeared to him in a mask, who it turns out presumably was Oswald arranging all of this stuff, arranging victims for him, arranging to get him yeah. to where he needed him to be. And then there is also this thing with the monks as well. So we saw these monks that appear to Detlef who warn him off, say, don't go to Castle Drakenfels. And then Prince Leopold, the, the emperor's son, also sees the monks during the hunting party on the way to Castle Drakenfels. And he says to everybody in the party has any, anyone know what these monks are about anyone know what they mean or who they are and oswald in what's probably the first big clue just denies it he's like, i have no idea at all don't yeah. know what they are and we know that he knows what they are because he's had a conversation with detlef about them so yes. this is that little yeah. moment of okay actually it's not quite right here i think i put that down at the time just to uh, he, he just wants this play to go ahead and he's almost that kind of things are going wrong this isn't 100 safe here yeah but we're gonna i can't i can't cancel it now so we need to get the head head down and get on with it and yeah and i did probably didn't kind of really that, and that's what's it great about that. it as a twist right because yes, yes there is a there is a reason like a legitimate reason he might have been a bit shady there but the yes. real reason is actually oh wow it's something way darker i think another thing that lends him legitimacy is that Genevieve, and we haven't talked about her too much, right? Because she's again, she's this weird kind of main character, but out of it for so much. But she's she's very wise for her six hundred years. She's a good judge of character. Um, it feels like she's a good judge of character. She's got, a, you know, she just seems like the 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 calm person, the smart head in the room, even if slightly detached. But she's fooled by him as well. Mm. She, you know, and and and, it, and I think because she liked him, she lends him legitimacy that you think well he, he can't be bad because she'd have noticed she would have she would have gone well this isn't right sort of thing um and yeah. i think that lends to it as well um how could she how does she get that wrong sort of thing yeah like i think that. you're right <laughs> yeah I think that's spot on and i think it's a good point we've not talked about genevieve as much as we should have and i think she represents probably one of the sort of key themes in the novel which is that the difference between appearance and and how people perceive one another and perceive things versus the reality underneath. And obviously we see that with Oswald where he seems to be the hero, but actually he's the villain. We see it with Detlef where he seems to be a sort of layabout who's, who's a bit maybe lazy and a bit self-involved, but actually steps up at the end and does the right thing in a couple of places. Yes. And Genevieve, who appears to be young, who appears to be almost this, you know, frail or not frail, but not a sort of strong warrior. She appears yes. to be like a 16-year-old girl, is actually 663 years old and is incredibly wise and has had all of these different jobs and careers and this enormous life. Yeah. There's a real sort of interesting point there around who who is what they appear to be and who is not. See, I couldn't picture her as young. I know she was described as a 16-year-old girl, but because of the... the her character she was so knowledgeable and 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 you told how old she was i that overrode anything mm. any descriptor of her being young so i didn't see her as a 16 year old i saw her as maybe a mid-20s late 20s obviously attractive woman and there's no that she that he uses her quite a lot in that sense there's there's this sort of romantic interest and yeah. attraction with a few people that underlies that. And that's kind of playing on the, the, the whole idea of a sexy vampire, which we see in so many <laughs> different worlds. No, it's, it's a thing, isn't it? It's yeah. not vampires. There's, there's a few vampires that aren't like that. There's um, 
lots of different versions of vampires out there. There's the almost bestial style, but an awful lot of it is attractive people, isn't it? In yeah. Films and stories and that. That the book leans into that quite a lot, doesn't it? She's yeah. I mean, there's definitely some Anne Rice kind of inspiration drawn in the creation of this version of vampires for Warhammer, and because you even have at one point there is this the grandmother character of Genevieve who appears to be almost a tw- uh, like a 12 year old girl or a, a potentially even younger than that even though she's even yes. older than Genevieve yeah. and she kind of talks like a grandmother but uh, like talks about having sired all these vampires and enjoyed life and now she's in her retirement and her dotage <laughs> when actually she looks like a child and that's straight out of interview with a vampire right and there's a lot yes. of other yeah. stuff like that and yeah. the eroticism is of vampire and that was the, because she was that. only in it for a short period that was the, I I could accept that because it was described in that moment in the book mm. but because the way Genevieve was written and the situation she finds herself in. I mean, they're not erotic scenes, but there's definitely sexual romantic scenes, moments yeah. in, a, sure. in, in the feeding and things. You know, that, that's deliberate. Hmm. Um, again, probably to titillate 15 year old boys reading the books back in the nineties, but it's, it's definitely there. And yeah. I, it's, I'm, <laughs> quite, my, my brain definitely was well away from, this is a young younger girl at those sure. points. It didn't feel like that. It felt quite mature. Yeah, um, I, and I, I think atti- you're right. That's and her, her attitude to it, and and that like the I don't want to feed too much. I don't want to endanger these people. That kind of care and stuff feels mature and older. Um, yeah. So it's easy as a reader. Well, I found it easy to just picture her as yeah, as as someone much older. I suppose. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think it is. It's definitely written in that way, and and I think that's probably a good thing in the sense that yes, yeah, she is written as a character who has 600 years worth of experience knows what she's doing and it's like has is comfortable in her own skin in a way Mm. that some of the other characters maybe aren't i mean obviously oswald is not comfortable at all despite all of his privilege and detlev i think over the course of the novel finally discovers who he is and he sort of Mm -hmm. finds himself as not quite as selfish and you know that early version of detlev that we see He's never he's never totally selfish. He's not a terrible person by any means. He he helps all of the other prisoners from his debtor's prison yes, cell. Really nice touches. Yeah, like that, there's things it's... like that. Where, so there's the seeds of okay, actually he's not a bad guy, and he's got a, a great friend, uh, Brughel, who is a uh, human who suffers from uh, dwarfism or afflicted with dwarfism, uh, and who is constantly mistaken for a dwarf by yes. other humans that's quite an interesting kind of very interesting character in yeah well. it creates a really interesting point of of sort of seeing prejudice in this world because yeah. the dwarves reject him and the humans reject him because he's he's of neither world and mm-hmm. then it transpires that he also has been afflicted with a sort of chaos uh, the mutations of chaos as well and that's probably he, why he uses a device to talk about prejudice around we talked mm. about this with the the way mutation is treated in yes. England and armies and it's really interesting that that kind of it's almost pseudo medical problem rather than yeah. that kind of get you to the warp you um you beast of chaos kind of thing and it's a there's a there's a real change there and and i think that's why the the, the prejudice around dwarfism is used in the story because it almost leads into how people react to him when they find out that, that he's a mutant um, and it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because it's, it's not long after someone else has been murdered. Secret passages lead back to all the players' rooms and then they discover him um, naked or naked enough that his mutation is showing in it. And mm. when he's discovered, he's, he starts crying because he, he knows the game's up, then he's unable to hide his mutations. Um, and he gets blamed for the, for the murders because actually he's a mutant and he's tortured and, and ends up, well, sort of, did he kill himself or not? He, he ends up exploding in a really, in, yeah. in a really strange death. But Detlef is, is is upset, really upset about him. Um, yeah. and, and pushes and, for and him to be treated to, better as well, right? Yeah, and, can, and even even in his even after his death, he wants some kind of retribution for him. He wants him to be remembered as a good person, not as a mutant. And that's almost a dangerous thing. It feels like it's a dangerous thing to stand up for. Yeah. Um, in 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 certain societies in or maybe all societies in the empire at that point yeah um and i thought that was really interesting um and almost quite mature in some ways that real real themes there that you could have not had in a fantasy book and people wouldn't have missed them but it re- added some real 
kind of grimness and depth and reality to it and add, add steps to the, the characters and you like Detlef more and more I think throughout the book and yeah things like that just show actually he's a really good person I agree yeah and because I, I think you're right as well when you sort of say about that reveal sequence that the scene where you you find out or the other characters find out that Bruce Hell is a mutant and he does cry and just before that there's a little moment where he's had to himself and he's sort of re reflecting on the fact that he is a mutant and how he's not been able to live the life he would have wanted, not just yes. because of, you know, the sort of physical impacts, but like his emotional impacts as a result of all that stuff. And that's quite a sad, poignant scene. And it it's effective for a number of reasons because it is quite emotional, but it's also a great, it's does double duty because it sets up a bit of a red herring and and we are now yes. questioning oh wow is is brug hell a villain here as well so we're sort of put into the position of the bad guys who ultimately persecute him because we're presented with enough information to know okay so he's sad and he's human and he has these feelings but also he is a mutant and he has this sort of uh physical thing you definitely question don't you yeah, i don't think do, i thought it, for any moment it was him but could he be involved? Maybe. Exactly. And, it's, it's, it and you're it supposed was... to, right? You're set up yeah. to do that. And there's a few things like that as well. I mean, even down to, so Laszlo even having a, a sort of a, a dark sponsor kind of creates yes. this question of, well, there's a bit of a red herring around Laszlo then, because is he Drakenfels? Is he working for Drakenfels? Who is this other guy, Drakenfels? Is there is Drakenfels not even going to be in it? And it's all some new plot, some new cult or something. There's a lot yeah. of different ways it could go, and it it draws your attention to Laszlo as the villain, and draws you away from you know the the hidden in plain sight villain. But then, yes, thinking more broadly about the kind of themes at play, besides that one of appearances as and, and sort of whether people are what they seem to be, there's this kind of like meta, multi leveled narrative because we're we we don't know the real events, we don't know what really happened in the original Drakenfell's quest, but we're seeing someone trying to interpret it and put a play on. And mm. the play has the same name as the book. It's got the same five act structure as the book. So we're sort of reading it from this level and Detlef is seeing it from another level and Oswald and Genevieve are another level below because they lived it. And constant yeah. Drakenfell's is over the whole thing. I mean, actually again, in the Patreon chat, uh, one of the patrons, uh, Tommy, came up with a really good point just around that sort of meta narrative and how many different layers and lenses are at work. And it very mm -hmm. much seems to be from the mind of an author who likes stories and telling stories. And the reason he's chosen a play and the theater to be the vehicle for a story in the Warhammer world is because you then get to sort of play around with what a story is and how you tell yes. a story and interpret it yeah yeah absolutely it's um it's a yeah it goes back to what we were sort of saying at the beginning about how any how much of an interesting way it was to do that mm -hmm. an interesting way to tell the story and it really pays off um in in, in the way it delivers it um and at that point of oh this is an interesting way i still wasn't you, you weren't sure how it was going to go but um that those multiple layers just fit together really really nicely i don't think mm. there's there's much i would think oh, i don't know if that worked to be honest with you there's, there's very i don't think there is anything really a minor change here or there um but um just paid off something you said actually in the the um the patreon chat when you talked about once Drakenfels has been defeated and then you have um you have oswald fighting and it, it detlef kills him and you thought that it should have been genevieve and i was mm. i was i was working today while watching that and i was like yes you're absolutely right it did feel a little bit yeah how much, it's almost felt like death left wrote the story because he would have <laughs> wanted to make himself uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you himself have... the hero again because <laughs> because he, he'd already done this massive massively heroic thing even even if it wasn't directly um him that was doing it even well if his was... heroic thing in the in the in the battle so you in the, in the final conflict we've had drakenfels revealed on stage genevieve and detlef are both on stage in the the royal box we've got the emperor now put 
at th- is threatened by Oswald, who's got the knife to his throat. So you have this this super high tension, high stakes scene. The fight with Drakenfels between Detlef and Genevieve versus Drakenfels is really good. There's a few different things that happen. Genevieve tries to defeat him. She tries to suck his blood, but he's this kind of weird corpse. Gross, thing. really gross <laughs> scene. Isn't really it? gross. <laughs> so she's like sort of batted off, and Detlef's been thrown thrown to one side, and Detlef finds this hammer uh, that's been left. It shouldn't be there because it was it was used to create the scenery, but it's been left in the wrong place. And he grabs it even with a dislocated arm. And there's kind of this moment where he could run almost and he sort of yeah. is willing to stay. And that's his moment of, of heroism. But then the power of Sigma thro- yes. flows through the hammer, which he then uses to kill uh, Drakenfels. It's, it's your pure deus ex machina, the intervention of Sigma, the god. It comes out of nowhere almost. I quite liked it because... It's on a stage, and you're. Yes. It's, it's you know, it's classic like a, a, a device that happens in plays. Is you know, you just get this kind of the it's intervention a, of the gods to resolve an impossible it's, situation. It's almost like Newman went right for this next paragraph. I'm going to make it a Warhammer novel again, <laughs> like it was for that first part. <laughs> going to make it really Warhammer now, and yeah, and, and it's and it does it. But it, yeah, I it didn't didn't jar me at all. I thought well, uh, it, it works really makes well. Makes sense yeah. rather than Detlef just doing it without that because you, it almost would betray his overplay his character in the same way that maybe him killing Oswald slightly overplays his character. Yeah, maybe that was added because. Detlef got to do that himself without the aid of any. Yeah, that's a good point. Any, actually, any, any power of of of, of Sigma. So that was wasn't Detlef that defeated Drakenfels. Really, yeah. it was the it was the intervention of a god, and Detlef did his own heroic act by. Well, there's lots of people that could have dealt with Oswald there. Lots of people. Oswald wasn't going anywhere. You've got these elector counts everywhere and they're guards. You've got Genevieve's coming back to coming back around again. And you know, she could have dealt with him and he does it. Yeah. Putting his own life at risk needlessly, really. That's a really good point. I had so, so maybe it was that, his but yeah. moment, but because it felt like he's already had his moment so close to it, it yeah. kind of kind of misses a little bit. Yeah, I mean so I, I like the idea that his moment, if you like, is him choosing to stay and fight. Even yes. even though it's not his forte, and then Sigma steps in and does the big final blow. You're right, though. Him having a moment of right, he knows how to fence because he's a trained fencer, and he he's even name dropped earlier in the story Oswald's yes. fencing coach. So we know he knows how Oswald fights, and he uses that to win. So there's a moment of like, okay, actually, he's he's cleverly defeated Oswald here. I mean, my yeah. my sort of picture in terms of. If there was a minor change I would make in retrospect, you know, not that I'm questioning Kim Newman, because I think it's a fantastic novel. It's amazing. But if I was going to tweak something, it would have been that Genevieve steps in and defeats Oswald mm-hmm. because that closes the loop on their story because they were together at the start. She was really yeah. impressed by him. She had fallen in love with him to an extent over yes. the course of the book. That love and affection sort of slowly transfers from Oswald to Detlef, and we sort of yes. see that in real time. And then this final moment would be the end, severing completely the relationship with Oswald, and and it's sort of proving to be the right choice that she never, she never actually did start a relationship with Oswald, even over those twenty five years. She does. She says she doesn't really know why, and it's because. He's actually evil, and she maybe she so did. Maybe maybe underneath. she did know, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it would have been a nice pair because I think Detlef stayed for his love, for Genevieve. Really, that was it. He, sure, it's almost that moment I think that he realised that he wanted to protect her, and and that's why he did it more. Yeah, I don't think he picked up or, or stayed because he thought I can I can save the uh, no sure. world here. <laughs> I think he, he was he was for her um, because she'd yeah. already jumped in. I suppose she jumped in to attack anyway so she almost saved him she did yeah she? Definitely. so you know she saved him he saves her yeah. and then she's gonna save him i don't know but I, i'm with you i would have that would have worked quite nicely as well but you're right in terms of okay actually it is a great moment for detlef to prove himself in another way and sort of have that moment that's not it's not sigma this is just detlef 
And then Oswald is defeated. We do get a great cameo as well from uh, Johan, who was the hero yes. in the Ignorant Armies. So he's now back in the Empire as an elect count, having gone and saved his brother Wolf. That was really nice. I quite like that. Because when I first read yeah. the book, he was just a guy. And I was like, okay, there's there's some, some elect account who's pretty cool. Now, with a bit more knowledge of who he is, it actually plays as quite a cool MCU like style cameo, which is quite nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's, you you get success. And it's just kind of this, the denouement is kind of a happy ending for pretty much everyone else, right? We sort of get, I mean, <laughs> there's a, I thought it was very funny. In the in the sense that we we want to know what happened to Detlef and Genevieve, that's kind of you're desperate to know what what was their end of the story, yeah. and Newman goes through everyone else first, like pretty much every character that we've encountered right the way back to the debtors' prison at the very start. We just find oh, and then this guy did this, and then this person did this, and then this person retired here. Some people get happy endings. Most people get happy endings, really, yeah. except for the people who don't deserve them. They all get a bit of karmic justice as well. It's just like a movie, isn't it? It's like, yeah. a, like again, it's like a, a, a sort of '90s movie when you when you get cut in between the credits, you'll get little pictures yes. pop up of certain yeah. characters doing their fate. You know, the couple that didn't get together hugging at the end or something. Or it's just, it's, it's it's so film like, and it makes sense with with what he does. Yeah, but, um, it, it wasn't needed at all, really. <laughs> But I didn't mind, but it was, yeah, it was quite long. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, I thought it was funny for that joke of, like, just m forcing you to, to like, anticipate what, what it's going to yes. be. But they do, they get a nice happy ending. They they end up together, Genevieve and Detlef, and Detlef gets to sell the Drakenfell's play, slightly rewritten to reflect the truth at the end. Yeah. And then he is very successful. He he and his company found a new theatre, and they, they rename it to... On a uh, Hell, his his friend who is uh, who died during the event. It's and... some kind of co ownership as well, isn't there? Yeah, it's like it, a cooperative. Yeah, yeah, it's a very weird detail to have into in a story. And by the way, it didn't just own it; it was a cooperative. Well, I think that's like, nice. Yeah. I mean, that it's again lovely, is that but it's also yeah. it's just like these strange little bits of detail that you just yeah. wouldn't think you'd find in a Warhammer novel. That that's just just nice, but <laughs> odd. <laughs> so here's my question: Given that it has so it do, it is a slightly different flavor of Warhammer novel to to many that we see over the years, and it is a slightly different view of the Warhammer world. There's those inconsistencies like the vampire stuff, and there's a few others. Constant Constant Drakenfels himself doesn't really it doesn't work in the universe that will come to be the sort of standard Warhammer universe because Nagash kind of takes on a lot of that power and a lot of that history. Yeah, with that in mind. Do you think this would make a good Warhammer movie? If you were if you were commissioning a Warhammer fantasy movie, the first movie, as this is the first novel, do you think this is a good introduction to the Warhammer world? I think it would make a good movie. I'm not sure it would make a good Warhammer movie. There's mm. there's too much that's inconsistent with the known norms. We we touched on very briefly dwarves, and I think you covered it more in the 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 patron track. The dwarves aren't quite as recognizable as, as as warhammer dwarves um and i think you summed it up when i think it was definitely a couple of the patrons were talking about it um but i think you summed up these are these are city dwarves these are imperial dwarves aren't they they're empire dwelling dwarves rather than dwarves from the the, the, the dwarven hold so that may be why they're different that's absent from from warhammer hmm. by the time well it's absent from warhammer in in ignorant armies in the in the world that uh if felix and, and Godric and felix live in really hmm. um at least they don't come up in there um so they that disappears quite quickly the vampires are different but i think you can get around that i think you can kind of they just don't make their way to the tabletop so to speak sure um, i don't think drakenfels is a problem either if you didn't have nagash i think the only sure. problem is because they went down a different art so so no i'm not sure you could but it would still make a great film. But it would just yeah. would feel it'd make a better Dungeons and Dragons film than it would make a. <laughs> yeah, that's you've interesting. You've got more scope point. there, haven't you? You got because it scope. feels it feels very much. I mean, kind of like some of the stories in Ignorant Armies. Actually, it feels very much of Warhammer Fantasy role play. Yes, more than Warhammer Fantasy battle. I think. Um, oh, it's it's first dead <laughs> role yeah. play, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, which probably, I haven't looked, but I bet you there's a a playwright. Um, 
career class or something. I probably yeah, I, I couldn't say me. for sure, but it feels like there would be right. And they did all they did a lot of the characters from these novels and several of the other GW books as Warhammer Fantasy role play stats. They started them up. You can actually play. You can have Drakenfels in your game if you want. They're to. in here, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. There They're you go. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and and Drakenfels will just yeah TPK everyone right <laughs> as you would expect unless you do a, a deal with him and then play twenty five yes. years worth of campaign. But yeah, well, you got a sledgehammer knocking, <laughs> <laughs> knocking <around. Yeah. laughs> But I I really like this version of the Warhammer world. This this role play version. I think. It's, it might be my sort of, broadly speaking, my kind of favorite flavor of Warhammer Fantasy with mm-hmm. this kind of messy, muddy world. And there's a lot of, yeah, there's inconsistencies and there's stuff floating around all over the place, but it's such such a fun world to spend time in. And I agree. Yes. I think this would make a fantastic film. I personally, because I really like this version of the Warhammer world, would love this to be the Warhammer movie. Uh, but yes. I completely understand that it is quite different to to a lot of other Warhammer, but I mean, this for me in my head canon, this kind of Warhammer world does exist, hmm. but it almost feels like the timeline that doesn't really move in the text has moved in my sure. head, if that makes sense. And that's the, I, I feel like that they, they all exist just in slightly different planes of existence, maybe, and they sure. all they all work. And the, the Warhammer world that's on the tabletop on square bases it is different, slightly different to the the role play one because you you need more layers and it's all they all feel like what happened to me but yeah but again it's the era i came into to understanding warhammer my introduction to warmer warhammer was third ed fantasy and, and first ed warhammer fantasy role play so that was the year i was introduced to it so it does feel very normal but yeah i don't I couldn't see it being made into a movie that was Warhammer. but it's a good enough story that is very movie like but yeah um, very I cinematic don't, i don't think it's warhammer enough Right, that's fair. The only, that's fair. The only hammer in it isn't isn't it might it might, <laughs> it might be wielded by Sigmar's. <laughs> it's, it sounds like you something you pick up a B and Q rather than. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean it's fair. That's fair. I think you'd have an incredibly difficult casting process for Genevieve as well. So yeah, I think it'd be very tough to find. I, I, I don't think they'd make a sixteen for a start. I think they'd have no. to stay stay well clear of that. That would be yeah. But yeah, it was it, yeah. My my summary, if you like, is just that this this is it. This is a Warhammer novel, everything I wanted, and it's it's everything I wanted because I didn't even realize I wanted it. I didn't know that I wanted a horror comedy about the theater set in the Warhammer world. That just was not something I was looking for. But as soon as I had it and I was reading it, every page was just this is fantastic. Uh, and yeah, it just it flows really well. It's very, very like breezy, a very smooth read. I think I, I, you can fly through it. And I think yeah. <laughs> Kim Newman has said that he wrote it in something like three weeks because he was just in the in the zone and he didn't want to lose the thread of the plot. And that's why he just kept on going and just powered through. And that probably speaks to you know what some people might see as filler being some of these weird scenes or these little emotional beats or the kind of those odd details might be because actually he's just it's just a stream of consciousness almost yes um, but i like that i think that works really well i'm very excited that there's a lot more jack yeovil mm-hmm. sort of kim newman's uh pen name we've got more of his work to yes. come throughout the rest of these gw books yeah, I'm looking for. I remember the, he was the only one I'd read before with the Dark Future book. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that and seeing if, whether they. It's been so many years since I read it that seeing whether I remember the stories or not. But I remember loving them, and I hope I still love them when we get to it. Um, but uh, we talked about what would make Warhammer films. I'm not sure any of them will. I got a feeling we'll get to number seventeen and go. Yeah, well, n- none of them could be used because none of them will represent. Warhammer, my feeling is they're probably all going to represent the the time sure, <laughs> that they yeah. were written in. Um, Most which likely, is good, yeah. it's really fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they, you're right. They are everything we've read so far is is of its time. The sort of the political atmosphere and the nature of storytelling and the 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 things that the writers have chosen to focus on and sort of elevate in the plot. 
all feels like, yeah, this is definitely coming from the concerns and the thoughts, the artistic movements of the late eighties. Um, and that might be why they're great as well, because they, 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 you know, that, that's when Warhammer was. <laughs> if yes. That makes sense in a way. I know there's lots of amazing stuff in later Warhammer stories and the books and the different editions. They all bring their own cool stuff. But for many, and in many ways, and maybe for me, this is an era that is just like, yeah, this is the real, this is the the real good Warhammer stuff. They all seem laced with. Well, let's say all oh, we've read two books um <laughs> one was multiple stories though so we think about that laced yeah. with a mischievousness um that you hear about the studio was at that point yeah um, and the way and their their look on the world and how yes. they let, allow that to reflect into the to the games a bit and um and I, I think you see that with the with these novels even though some of these writers were brought in brought in externally that's seen you know they brought in the right people to kind of keep that keep that going but uh, yeah good fun so I think we should add a new a new feature, Stu, which is just a thumbs up or a thumbs down for this particular book. So is this a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Oh, here? absolutely. Really, really loved it. And it will be something I return to one day. Yeah. Um, it won't be something I'll be reading to. I'll be looking for books to read to Jacob. And this, <laughs> because of certain elements in it, I, I, I won't be. There's, in fact, there's lots of elements that, that I won't be, whether that be the horror or the... Yeah, I'd hold off a few like years. The <laughs> bit, but I'll let him read it himself. But uh, <laughs> but um, it's it's something I'd like to return to in the, in the future because it's, it's good. It's good fun yeah. and it's an easy read. Yeah, no, absolutely. But we're not going to be returning to this anytime soon because we've obviously got another... 15 GW to books to go. We're going strong. Next up is Zaragoz. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is the first in the Orfeo trilogy. So yes. Brian Craig's Orfeo today. trilogy. Very excited to see this. I don't really know anything about this other than a couple of little bits and bobs. The actual nature of this story is going to be as big a surprise to me as as everything else yep. we've read so far. So well, I read the blurb on the back of the book, and I'm still none the wiser. So <laughs> <it's going> to... <laughs> but that's what we're going to be reading over the course of October, and we're going to be back with another book club here on the channel at the end of October. Before that, there'll be another Patreon live stream discussion where we get together and chat and sort of share our theories, share our ideas. That's going to be coming mid to late October. You can find out more on my website. I'll put a link in the description below. All of my patrons are invited to, to come and join me for that and to share your ideas. Uh, and everybody is invited to the next book club that will be taking place at the end of next month. Until then, Stu, where can people find you if they want to get more Stu? more stew miniature realms <laughs> um on all social media platforms you'll be able to find me in miniature realms but primarily the youtube channel miniature realms and it's lots of painting and and hobby including a lot of warhammer fantasy or old world stuff now but historical bits and stuff as well it might be if you like some of the videos in here and you play with toy soldiers there will be some videos that apply i'm sure absolutely yeah some great stuff on there you recently did an amazing sort of re-sculpt the rescue of the mighty fortress as well right which was really really cool a repaint i suppose i, I won't i've not sculpted anything on there for well, you, gaps, you created but... like a little keep for the center of it as well right oh a little extra bit yeah and that's growing now i've been building some stuff this evening for some future ah, Mordheim okay. type stuff so Mordheim will be covered soon as well so lots of warhammer fantasy stuff for people who like that fantastic that's great right well let's leave it there then thank you everybody for joining us for this book club discussion of Drakenfels. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs>